So let's get started. We're talking about AMP Vertio. So I'll explain what these things are as we go along. First, a little bit about me. Um, so I'm Bill Mills. I've been with Lenaro for about three and a half years. Been a member of the OpenAMP project for about seven years and a uh, founding member of the Yocto project. Um, focused exclusively on open source since 2008 and long history before that. A um, little bit about Lenaro. Um, I like to think of Lenaro as the nexus of open source for ARM. Um, Lenaro has a lot of missions. One of them right now is AM, uh, Vert.io for the edge and AMP Vert.io fits into that. Uh, a little bit about the OpenAMP project. The goal of the OpenAMP project is to make the user's job easier, the programmer's developer's job easier whenever you're dealing with an AMP system, which is, it could be two OSs, different OSs talking to each other, different CPU cores, um, or different discrete systems, even if those things are the same. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. So the outline of, of today's talk, um, so this is in the ELC track, but we're, you know, this touches on Zephyr, it touches on real time, it touches on safety aspects. So it, it really kind of fits into all the tracks that we're talking about this week. Um, I'm gonna talk about the background of what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, a review of what Vert.io MMIO is, and then the problems those that Vert.io MMIO has when um, trying to do this on an AMP system um, and solutions, our suggested solution to those problems. Um, talk about the status and the code pointers, credits, um, and then at the end, I'm gonna talk about a probable change in direction that we're thinking about. Uh, and then we have the wrap up. So, why, why are we talking about Vert.io? So I think of Vert.io as the universal donor for para-virtual uh, device interfaces. Um, so, you know, Vert.io grew up in the KVM uh, ecosystem, but it's being de developed by other, it's being uh, implemented by other hypervisors, it's being used by bootloaders, um, aftermarket software, Lots of different things. Um, so again, kind of the universal donor for virtual interfaces, virtual device interfaces. Um, <clears throat> AMP Vert.io, um, why are we doing, so we, all those good things about Vert.io, we want to bring them to um, AMP systems. So you, different cores, different uh, systems, different operating systems. Things that make Vert.io traditionally uh, hard to implement between those systems, we want to overcome those and provide Vert.io in that context. Um, and then for our definition, uh, the lowest common denominator that you, to make this work is a shared memory and some sort of bi-directional notification. We'll talk about different instances of that. <clears throat> so, why am I talking about Zen and Zephyr? Well, um, both projects are good open source projects with open governance. Both are, uh, have a group that's looking at functional safety, which is important. So if you're gonna have a reference hypervisor, Zen is a great one to choose. If you're gonna have a, a reference RTOS, Zephyr is a, is a great one to choose. Did I say that right? Zen, Hypervisor, Zephyr, Artos. So they're great references. The OpenAMP project wants to be neutral. Lenaro wants to get Vert.io everywhere, regardless of Hypervisor. Um, OpenAMP wants to be portable to lots of different Artoses, but these are the leading integration reference platforms. Um, Zen is a type one hypervisor. Type one hypervisor is very important when you're dealing with functional safety or mixed critical systems. Um, being able to update the kernel without updating the hypervisor, being able to safety certify the hypervisor to a higher 
uh, safety level than you can for the Linux kernel. These are all important things, um, and that's why we're focused on a type one hypervisor. So here's an example of an AMP system. This is sort of the classic example where OpenAMP has always existed and been used. Um, but this is an AMP SOC. Um, AMD Xilinx makes these, TI makes these, ST makes these, NXP. You've got lots of examples here. Um, but you have, traditionally, you're going to have some SMP capable uh, cores that are, can run SMP Linux, and you're going to have some other types of cores. They could be Cortex M or R or DSPs or some other type of DSP that's not going to be running um, Linux. So, <clears throat> and this is what OpenAMP has, has traditionally done. Um, to make this work, there's normally some sort of shared memory, usually firewalled or protected. So, the MCU can't trash Linux and things like that. And then some sort of a mailbox system. Um, again, this is where OpenAMP has always existed, but now even in this situation, we're not, we're not gonna just do RP message, we're going to do uh, other types of vert IO. So we also wanna expand out to uh, AMP systems that are created using PCIe. So you have um, a root complex, maybe it's an x86 machine, and you plug in an ARM SOC-based PCI card. You've created an AMP system. Those two systems will not share a hypervisor. They can't use traditional vert IO in this case. Um, even if both sides were ARM or both sides were x86 and they were both running Linux, it's still AMP because it's not, not the same Linux instance. So we have this case with the root complex and endpoint, another common situation that you find. Um, I see it in automotive uh, reference, references more and more, is where you have two PCI systems. They both think they're root complex, but then they're plugged into what's called a non-transparent bridge. So that transparent bridge bridges those two systems, but each side of it thinks they're the root complex. Um, and that trans non-transparent bridge will allow you to share some portion of your memory with the other side, provide some sort of a doorbell mechanism. So again, that, that's all we need for, to make this work. Um, if you talk about the chiplet ecosystem, I don't know much about the chiplet ecosystem, but it looks like this is gonna be a good match for, for that ecosystem too. Um, it's, a, it's PCIe, plus plus that's being used there. So I, you know, I think this fits right in. And with that ecosystem, you're kind of mix and matching. You can easily create different types of AMP systems. So I think this is gonna be important. Uh, to simulate this, what we do is use two instances of QEMU and QEMU supports a peripheral called IV shared memory um, that appears like a PCI card to the two instances but then it has a shared memory between them and doorbell mechanisms, and those doorbells end up as MSIs on the other side. So with those two QEMU instances, you can simulate right on your desktop this kind of a system. Okay, so the other, the other type of AMP that we're talking about is um, an AMP that's created under a hypervisor. So if you, in this instance, they're all A53s. You, you could run SMP on all of them, um, but you've chosen to partition out some of them and you're going to run an RTOS on those. And you're probably gonna pin those uh, virtual CPU to physical CPU. Um, you, you're gonna worry about real time on those. Maybe you're interested in functional safety for those. And then you're gonna have other CPUs where <clears throat> you're going to let Zen, you know, overcommit and float the virtual CPUs. And, and so, that, again, that's sort of a mixed critical system. This is AMP because you have Linux plus RTOS. So it's still AMP. And we're going to talk about, well, I guess that's the next slide. So why, why do you need us to do in this case? Why do you need the same 
but, but then you get into a mutual trust. And so if either side screws up, then you, you, you know, you screw up both sides. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, the, the statement from the audience was you don't really need the hypervisor. You could just set things up on both sides to, to do this. But if you do that, both sides sort of have to trust the other not to screw up. Um, the hypervisor is there. If you have the hypervisor present, he can isolate you from the other side screwing up. So <clears throat> Zen has their own para virtual um, device drivers. Uh, Zen has been adding support for VertIO already, and this is the traditional VertIO. So why do they need VertIO AMP? Well, at least right now, the way Zen does VertIO is we're going to talk about the magic memory in a minute. But when whenever you do a transport operation, the, the guest writes to um, the MMIO area. The hypervisor traps that, turns it into a message called an IO request, and sends it over to DOMU or whoever's serving that virtual device. That virtual CPU is now stuck and can't make progress until the other side responds to that I.O. request. So if you're trying to do real time or you're trying to do functional safety, you've now got a big problem because you don't know if that other side's going to respond. You don't know. Um, it could be a big code base that's hard to safety certify. So you want to decouple these things. So if you use the AMP techniques, that then it comes into, uh, you get your shared memory the way you want it, you send a notification, <clears throat> now you go about your business, the, de the device side will respond or not, and you have to be prepared for the or not case, but you can make progress on your side regardless of what he's doing. So that's why we think the AMP techniques are, um, would be a benefit to Zen. So let's talk about the AMP part. First off, a review of what VertIO MMIO is. First off, if you don't know VertIO at all, there's the protocols or the device types as they're called in the spec that, you know, VertIO block, VertIO net, console, RNG net, I2C. Um, so these describe the wire protocols for the, the contents of the buffers. You put that data into buffers, you put those buffers into V rings. Uh, the interface is called vert queues, but the implementation is V rings. And then you notify the other side through the transport mechanism. Before you can do any of all that, the transport mechanism has to negotiate. This is what type of device you're dealing with. Um, the driver side tells the, the device where it put the V-rings and how big they are um, and what features you're going to have negotiated for this. And in, one, in VertIO 1.2, there's these new things called shared memory segments. All that gets negotiated through the transport mechanism. And there's multiple transport mechanisms. VertIO MMIO is one. VertIO PCI is another. Um, at the end, we'll talk about VertIO CCW, which is an IBM thing. But if you look at VertIO MMIO, which might be the easiest to understand, um, and typically the one we want to implement in an RTOS, <coughs> it consists of two things. It could, a 256-byte area that's the MMR area, and then typically an M a 256-byte area for the config structure. So. The MMR space has the magic numbers, the version, the device types, um, and <clears throat> it has configuration for the vert queues, the features, and things like that. The 256-byte config space is normally information provided by the device to the driver about the device. Uh, usually it's fairly static, but the spec allows for a very interactive config space um, the device could be changing it. The driver could be making changes. Um, <clears throat> there can be side effects to changing the config space. Most people rightly don't make use of those features, but it is part of the spec. Um, and all that VertIO and MIO stuff 
uses this hypervisor magic that I talked about. Um, like the notifications, you send a notification by writing to something um, and that's supposed to automatically clear. Uh, receiving a notification, uh, an event, um, you read the register, it's supposed to automatically clear. If you're just dealing with plain memory, that doesn't happen, right? So we need to eliminate that magic. So the AMP vert IO, at least the definition that we're talking about today, is a variation of vert IO, MMIO, um, with several um, changes. So we're talking about a device side, a driver side, and then I defined a role called a coordinator. A coordinator can be something very simple, like a bootloader that zeroes out memory before things start, or it can be an active component on one, uh, in one of the domains where it is um, doing hot plug of devices and it, it can be very active. Um, so super simple or very active. You always have the vert AMP vert IO memory area, which again now is still 512 bytes. Um, and there's always some form of bidirectional notification between the two people involved. And we'll talk about how that works. And then, so, and then typical usage of this, there's gonna be a single shared memory segment and all the V-rings and all the buffers are gonna go into that single segment. Um, you can use this transport mechanism when you have more flexible memory structure um, where maybe the device side can see all the memory of the driver side. This is where Vert.io grew up. KVM, the host, can see all the memory of the guest. Um, if you don't have that, if you don't have that constraint, then this you can still use the transport mechanism. Some of the problems I talk about later, you won't have. Um, we, and you may have more than one shared memory segment. You may have a couple of shared memory segments. It, on an AMP SOC, it would be a good idea to have a shared memory segment for on-chip SRAM and a shared memory segment for DDR because different types of data structures work better in one versus the other. Um, you also may have an IOMMU or in Zen you have page grants. Um, this allows you to be freer with the memory that you use, but it's then guarded um, by the IOMMU or the page grant mechanism. So the problems we're dealing with, um, if we just look at the transport level, we have one of the problems is initialization delay. In, in traditional vert IO, you know, KVM is running, the device is there before the guest ever starts. Um, so in an AMP system, maybe they're both booting at the same time. Um, so you're kind of racing with each other. So this is why I talked about a bootloader filling memory with zeros, you know, in the shared memory segment. The bootloader fills it with zeros, then both, both systems can boot in parallel when, when the device side is ready, he's going to populate the header structures. The driver is not going to try to use the device until that's ready. Um, and then <clears throat> we're going to use a different magic and version combination for Vert.io AMP so that the driver side knows that that's um, going to happen. He may know that already because of device tree or some other mechanism. But this is, boot, uh, you know, suspenders, belt and suspenders. Um, and then, the, then there's the problem of the index-based um, configuration. If you look at vert IO, MMIO, <clears throat> you configure one vert queue at a time. You say, you write an index and say, I'm going to configure vert queue one. There's some device-side implement information that you read and then you um, configure where you're going to put the, the, the V-rings for that vert queue, and then, you, and then it magically is done. Um, in the AMP system, what you're going to do is you're going to write the index, you're going to send a, a unique notification that says, I've written the vert queue index, you're going to wait for the response, you're going to read any information from the device, you're going to populate the vert queue information, 
and then you're going to send an up a notification that says I've updated the vert queue information. And so it's it's got this handshake um, between it that <clears throat> that works through notifications as opposed to the magic memory that the hypervisor did. And then that kind of gets into the notification. There's a in memory. There's a, a unique memory notification structure that can be used. Um, so you get these fine grained notifications. Um, and then there's a shared level of notification where um, on an AMP SOC, it could be just a, a register you write to cause an IRQ to the other side. On the PCIe to the root complex, it's, it's always going to be an MSI. Uh, and probably there's an MMR you poke to cause a, an interrupt to the other side. And then on Zen, we're going to use Zen events. Um, that is a hypervisor call, but it pops into the hypervisor and then pops back out. So it doesn't have this hang on to the virtual CPU problem. Config changes. There's no great solution for, for VertIO, the MMIO based AMP. Um, again, it relies a little bit on hypervisor magic. Um, there is one thing we're, we can do, which is to say that when the generation counter for configuration is odd, it means the other side is changing it and you should reread. This is sort of an enhancement to what's already there. Um, on the driver side, you're supposed to read the generation counter, read the data, read the generation counter again. If they're not the same, you're supposed to retry. This is an enhancement or an in extra condition to it. If it's odd, you're also gonna do the reread. Okay, so that's the transport level. Now, maybe you don't have any of the memory problems that, that I talked about, and all you need is the, the transport level problems. Well, great, then you're done. Um, but if, if you have that single shared segment that many of the AMP systems are gonna have, you have the memory problems also. Um, <clears throat> I say this slide is fuzzy. Uh, it's fuzzy because we don't have a concrete plan for how to solve these problems in the kernel, when the kernel is the consumer of this. Um, these problems are fairly easy to solve on the RTOS library or in QEMU where we have a little bit more freedom, but we gotta figure out the, a good structure to fit it into the kernel. Um, and when I talk about the change of direction, I think there's some help here. But the problems that we're dealing with are in, in VertIO as defined by the standard, um, all the V-rings, all the buffers are communicated with driver-side physical addresses. That's no problem for KVM because he knows the complete layout of physical addresses for the, for the guest. In an AMP system, you may not have all that knowledge. So <clears throat> there's the, the solution that we're gonna implement first is just give the device side more information about uh, the driver side. So we'll have a, uh, this can either be through device tree or a rendezvous uh, memory structure in the shared memory structure where the driver side populates. This is where I see this memory segment. You know how big the memory segment is so you can calculate everything else. So <clears throat> that's one problem. Another problem is the vert queues and the buffers. If you have constrained memory, uh, the vert queues and the buffers need to be allocated from that constrained buffer, the strained shared memory segment. In the kernel, this probably looks like a um, device-specific DMA pool or something like that. That's why I say it's a little fuzzy. Um, it could also be that you doing copy operations, um, and that's where the software I.O. TLB comes in. It's also called bounce buffers. Um, so the, the, the driver side definitely needs changes to address this. Um, and then also on AMP, so AMP systems, you can have coherency issues. Maybe you don't have coherency issues. If, if they're both you know, coherent SMP capable and your hypervisor has mapped it correctly, then you know, it's magi magically coherent. You don't need to worry about anything. Um, but if you're actually talking to uh, an MCU on chip, 
maybe he isn't coherent with your caches. Um, so <clears throat> the MMR space, best to do use uncached memory for that. For the buffers and the V-rings, you're going to have to use the DMA system to um, do the manual cache ops. Um, some more modern chips, the coprocessors can be IO coherent. Um, so this frees up Linux from having to worry about the DMA operations. And then the coprocessor side can either have it uncached, mapped uncached, or he does the manual cache ops. And again, I talked about you may not have all these other issues, but these are the problems that we're dealing with. Uh, that's not what I want. So, <clears throat> the status of the, this work is not what I was hoping it to be. Um, what we do have is this presentation and a white paper that describes this protocol in a lot more detail than I can go into here in the presentation. Um, we do have previous implementations and prototypes of the VertIO MMIO that I'll show you in a second. Um, but what I had hoped to show you today was take all those previous demos and prototypes and wrap them up um, and at least show Zephyr to Zephyr, Zephyr device to Zephyr driver uh, running under Zen um, and implementing this full protocol. Um, I ran out of time, got pulled into a different project. It didn't happen. So <clears throat> what I do have is um, with my repo here, you can at least, um, it's an easy getting started for running Zephyr on Zen under QEMU. Um, it should be easy to set up and, and try out some of the, the demos. I, you can run Linux and Zephyr in, in DOMU's started with Excel, or you can, uh, there's several DOMs, DOM zero less configurations that use U-boot to start all these things up at the same time. Um, and all those are there. <coughs> uh, I will land an event exchange with shared memory uh, system using two Zephyrs and shared memory and events, um, but it, it didn't make today. So sorry about that. But it will show up at this repo when it does. I talked about the previous demos. <clears throat> um, what we've already shown in the past um, and just recently got rebased and um, redone, we have in OpenAMP libraries and branches, we have um, VertIO, Zephyr using VertIO provided by QEMU. So this is not AMP VertIO, this is traditional VertIO MMIO, but this is Zephyr being enabled with VertIO. <coughs> we also have um, <coughs> an, a previous version of AMP VertIO using Zephyr de VertIO device drivers consuming VertIO devices provided by Linux user space in a fork of KVM tool. Um, this is a previous version of, of AMP VertIO where there's a little bit of prior knowledge about what the other side is expecting and doing, so not all the negotiation and stuff is happening, um, but it does kind of show the concept. And then yet another demo is we have the ST demo where the M4 is providing a VertIO I2C device and the Linux kernel is consuming that device um, from the M4. And again, this is using sort of a, a, a prototype of the AMP VertIO. Doesn't, in that model, the, the memory of the device and the memory of the driver side are the same, so it's not dealing with that. Um, and it, it's using a single notification for back and forth, but uh, it it's, shows the concept. And then <clears throat> I talked about this dual QEMU setup to simulate PCI-based systems. We have um, RP message nailed up between two QEMU instances over this IB shared memory. So that's another demo that we have. Oops. So I talked about probably doing a change of direction. 
as I walked through that, you may have detected that there's a lot of round trips involved in this in trying to simulate VertIO MMIO. And as I was writing all this up, it's like, this is a little crazy. All I'm really doing here is creating a poor man's message-based system. Um, why not just create a message-based system and forget the alignment with MMIO? I've, we've since learned that other people are thinking along the same lines. And so <clears throat> I think this is more likely to happen. Um, so this is something, so drop the alignment to the VertIO MMIO, um, keep the notification model, and keep the rendezvous data structure, and then define in memory, in shared memory, a mechanism for passing messages back and forth instead of these fake MMRs. And then the messages that will go between the two sides will be things like the driver will say, set vert Q5 to this size, here's the three physical addresses that you need to know. Um, <clears throat> and then the messages themselves, we're thinking about the vhost user has sort of a message-based um, interface, and then this other vert IO transport that I mentioned briefly at the beginning, the, there's an IBM, I guess, 360, um, um, Power, no, it's not power, um, but mainframe architecture has VertIO, um, and <clears throat> it's called VertIO CCW. It's also sort of message-based, so that's another place to look for alignment on what these messages should look like. So we're looking to switch to a message-based transport um, and, may, and hopefully align the messages with um, other people that are looking at the same sort of thing. Um, yep. So the things I talked about today <clears throat> involved a lot of people. Um, the, the demos, each of the previous demos um, were done by different people. All the credits are up here. Um, we have... Um, rather new, I am rather new to Zen, so I needed some help. Um, and I got that help from AMD Xilinx and Stefano and Michael, um, their credits here. And <clears throat> we do have um, some stickers for the OpenAMP project. And hopefully you can kind of see that we have represented somebody from um, Zen, somebody from Linux, and somebody from the Zephyr. Um, with the kite and the panda and the Linux. So that, that's kind of the concept behind the sticker. So uh, I think that's it for today. That's what I have prepared. So we can open it up for questions. I know it was fast. <laughs> Did I answer the questions about why are we interested in doing this? Or do you still have questions about that? Yeah, I don't know if it's a relevant question, but I've, I've just had one, I had one encounter with OpenAMP and AMP message on a Silinx. Uh, it was not the Sync MP, it was just the Sync 7000. Okay. Running without a hypervisor and no fire warning on the memory. But it was, uh, my task was to upgrade from the Silinx forked uh, OpenAMP to the mainline one. And that was kind of a pain because of lack of documentation and getting into stuff uh, for the first time. So now you're talking about changing it all again. And then maybe I have to do it one more time. So if you, the traditional users of the OpenAMP library are using, um, most often from the RTOS library, they're using the RP message implementation. So we're not touching that. Um, we're not taking away. So that type of VertIO is called VertIO remote proc. Mm -hmm. We're not touching that. Okay. Um, we're adding other VertIO transports. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of, in the past, VertIO... RP message worked over this vertio remote proc 
and nowhere else. It didn't work over VertIO MMIO. It didn't work over VertIO PCI. Another thing that will happen as we do this work is RP message will work in those other places also. Um, but <clears throat> so the zinc, um, I, I'm not sure how. I kind of feel your pain, but I, I, I think it's also a little bit of older code base. For the Zinc MP, um, AMD Xilinx is kind of keeping it up to date um, with the upstream pretty, pretty well. <clears throat> okay. But it is a portable library, so it's up to the vendors to implement it. Um, <clears throat> I would say that's one thing nice about Zephyr is <clears throat> you port OpenAMP to Zephyr and by the way, it's already done. Um, <clears throat> as long as Zephyr works on your chip, you know it's a lot easier to get <laughs> get this functionality working, right? So that's kind of why we chose Zephyr as the reference because it's you know it works on an M3, it works on an A53, lots of QEMU models. Is, is um, in a typical ARM SOC where you have normal world, secure world, is there any, where does that fit into this model, if, if at all? Maybe it doesn't. But. It does. Um, <clears throat> I think there's other people working in that area that will complement this. Um, but you could certainly imagine doing this exactly as I described, replacing the, the bidirectional notification with some, you know, SMC kind of thing, right? Um, but yeah, you could make it work exactly like I talked about. Um, <clears throat> the other, just today, I heard about somebody wanting to do a I2C driver. I2, they, they wanted Secure World to own the I2C bus. You know, publish it as a VertIO I2C and let Linux use it from there and maybe have a firewall in there that lets them get to some of the I2C devices, but not all of them, you know, that kind of thing. I think that's a prime example of this. Could you please share more on this? Like, uh, why not use Vertio RP message, uh, that Vertio remote proc, uh, and where does this, this fits instead? Right. So the question, <clears throat> if you couldn't hear, was why not just use services on top of RMP message instead of doing, doing this extra VertIO stuff? Um, it's a good question. Um, some of the users of RP message are just MCU to MCU. Um, and, you know, I don't know as VertIO net and VertIO block have a lot of value in MCU to MCU. <clears throat> but certainly whenever you have the Linux kernel um, involved, being able to tap into that existing ecosystem of drivers and not having to introduce a new RP message for networking. And when, by the way, RP message <clears throat> is really meant for control messages, not jumbo frames of, of, uh, of network, right? So <clears throat> it, it, to me, it seems... Um, you know, a former employee of mine used to do um, network acceleration on an R5. And then there was this big complicated system to bring the, get Linux to use that. It would be very natural for the R5 to expose a VertIO net to Linux. And if Linux is VertIO AMP capable, it would just know how to talk to that. Um, and it would be very natural for it to start using that. There's a lot, you know, it, it's basically reuse. If you have an ecosystem where these VertIO, these other types of VertIO devices are already supported, wouldn't it be great to support them in an AMP system? Uh, so in that, what is the discovery mechanism like? How, how does Linux know that uh, the remote code is telling to, uh, has support for VertIO need? And, and what is the discovery mechanism? Yeah, so several. Um, it can be just nailed up in device tree. So <clears throat> in device tree, you could say, here's a shared memory area with the VertIO MMIO structure, and here's the mailbox to, to send the notifications to. 
Um, it could also be this, this rendezvous data structure. Um, you could go looking at that, and it's kind of a lightweight sort of, um, not device tree, but kind of device description. It says, here's the MMIO devices that you can use. Um, <clears throat> you could also imagine <clears throat> maybe you have an RP message um, and you exchange RP message device uh, control messages that say you have a new MMIO, VertIO MMIO device, and it's over here. You, you, you could imagine a number of ways to do that. Thank you. I think we're, I think we're at time, aren't we? One more question. So you mentioned about the dual QMU, right? Yeah. Uh, do we need any tweaks to the QMU in order to make it to work, or stock QMU works out of box? Stock QMU works out of the box for that. Um, a tip, if you want to run Zephyr on Zen on QMU, you need QMU 8.2 or later. That was a very hard one piece of knowledge because um, <laughs> it just locks up. QEMU just locks up if it, on earlier view, versions. I don't know what's happening, but uh, but if if to you run my demo, I have a, a I packaged a version of QEMU nine <clears throat> to make that work. But if all you're interested in is running two Linuxes with the IV shared memory, that should work on any. I, uh, you do need the IV shared memory. Um, server, the <clears throat> not everybody publishes that. It is built out of the QEMU tree. Um, the Zephyr SDK ships it in the Xilinx version of the, the IV shared memory server is the same for everybody. Um, it has been for years, so any copy of it should do, do you. Okay, cool, thank you. All right, we'll call it quits there. Uh, we do have stickers at the at the back, so if you want a sticker, you can talk to Natalie. Thanks, guys.